Okay, so it's a pleasure for the last talk of the series to have Marcos Rigol from Penn State. And he will speak about unitary dynam from, you from unitary dynamics to statistical mechanics in isolated quantum systems. And uh, as we said, you can ask questions whenever you want. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Let me see if I can I can get the the screen here to. Okay. Okay. So okay, good. So so yeah, I can I can see you in the in the other computer. So yeah, thank you thank you very much for for the invitation. So it's just a pleasure um, to give this uh, this lecture, which uh, the idea is that it's going to be uh, very pedagogical, and um, and I'm trying to I will try to motivate uh, I guess state thermalization and how it helps or not uh, to understand what happens in in quantum systems. So again, feel free to to ask questions and. I mean, there is this uh, review we wrote a few years ago that that may may be useful if you have further questions that uh, that you don't have in the lecture. So this is the the plan of of the talk. So I'm going to have a, a motivation or about why why we care about this, and and then I will try to establish some connections uh, with uh, classical mechanics and random matrix theory, uh, and then I will get fully to to the question of, of quantum dynamics and, and how we, we understand it. So good. So let me start with a numerical experiment kind of to set the stage of what are the, the problems that I will try to address. So, and this is a numerical experiment in which I am going to open a box with interacting bosons and I'm going to open it in a bigger box. Okay. And, uh, and then I just want to see what happens. And what this uh, part of the of the animation will show you is what happens in real space with the density of the bosons. And what this is going to show you is what happens in momentum space. So what happens with the momentum distribution function? And OK, so I will let it run. And uh, you see in real space somehow what you expect. So the bosons expand into the bigger box. And after some time, uh, the density is kind of homogeneous up to fluctuations. And then if we look at what happens in the momentum distribution function, well, it changed from the original uh, uh, state and into, into something different, and it stopped changing. Okay? So if we look now at this in, in real space and momentum space, we see that the system has achieved some equilibrium. And, uh, and it's really fluctuating um, about that equilibrium. Okay, and that dynamics that I show you there in the numerical experiment was uh, unitary dynamics. So, so there was no coupling to any environment or anything. So that's kind of uh, what we are after. We want to understand why that happens and how we describe the state after this equilibrium is being is reached. Good. So, so let, let's go then over the, the things I want to emphasize. The first thing is that the, the expectation value of those observables they become uh, almost time independent. So there is no need to have a bath to see equilibration. Uh, the density uh, is nearly homogeneous and that's what we would expect in thermal equilibrium. And well, the uh, momentum distribution function is uh, still an open question, whether that's uh, something that uh, you will get in, in thermal equilibrium or not. Good, so, so that's, uh, that's kind of the stage. And as, as, as you know, this is something that people thought from the very early days of quantum mechanics. So as a matter of fact, von Neumann in uh, 29 uh, wrote a, a paper uh, uh, arguing that he had a proof of uh, ergodic theorem and then a theorem for uh, quantum mechanics. That somehow was uh, criticized and forgotten. And in uh, uh, more recent years, that falls on what in physics we call typicality and it's related to entanglement. And there are many works that have, uh, have uh, uh, studied this kind of, of problem. And uh, uh, like around 10 years ago, we, we actually realized that uh, it's uh, related to the simplest version of eigenstate thermalization, and if you want also to random matrix theory. So, so this talk is, is gonna be mostly about this eigenstate uh, thermalization. 
So why is it that, uh, I mean, one may ask, why is it that, that people are so interested in this? Uh, why, why things have changed right, since from Neumann's time? And, and one of the main reasons are experiments. So now we have actually experiments that can uh, probe dynamics of nearly isolated systems. So those are mostly these colarum experiments. And just to give you an idea, so uh, that uh, all started with this big achievement and that was uh, in 1995, uh, for which uh, the, the experimentalist got the Nobel Prize in 2001. And what they managed to do was to achieve both size and condensation. So they essentially have these, uh, they can trap atoms, uh, pretty conservative, pretty well to a good, very good approximation, conservative potential, and they can cool them down to extremely low temperatures. So here are sort of the parameters in the experiments. They, they have temperatures that range from one nano Kelvin to 100 micro Kelvin, very low temperature, and they can control the number of, of atoms. So they can then change uh, the interaction between the atoms, and they can also change the effective dimensionality and uh, really most interesting to me is they can even realize uh, lattice models that we use to describe uh, condensed matter system and strongly correlated systems. And they do, using, they do that using uh, laser beams. And they can um, essentially, uh, in this optical lattice, have bosons and load bosons, which uh, would be kind of a realization of a bose hover model. And they can also uh, load fermions. That would be a realization of a fermi howard model. And if you look at these models, what they have uh, in common is they have a term that is hoping it describes the jumping of the, of the bosons or the fermions around. And then there is another term that describes the interactions, I mean, either of bosons when there are multi multiple occupancies of a site and of fermions when you have the two uh, spin species uh, on, on a given site. So, so that's amazing. I just I want to show you just one experimental result, and this one I know well because so we were involved on it uh, of the kind of things that they can do. Okay, so so this is an experiment that was done in the group of Emanuel Block uh, uh, in Munich, and what they did is they can create um, essentially they can create a, a system. They can load fermions and and bosons that are nearly non-interactive. Okay, so. so now, theoretically, we uh, want to think of this as a homogeneous, uh, if you want, on infinite system with a given side occupation of the fermions and a given side occupation of the form, of the bosons. Now, what the experimentalists could do is they could uh, increase uh, like this lattice depth and in such a way that the bosons and the fermions could not jump around. So remember the, the Hamiltonian I showed you before, so is they, they can make this exponentially small so that the system is mostly dominated by interaction. But again, that's a system of bosons and fermions. So, so there are the, the two types of particles. And, and then the question is, uh, what happens when you let it evolve? Uh, well, the, the side occupations don't change. Uh, but if you look at what happens in momentum space, it will change. Now, if, uh, if you look at this problem of interacting bosons and fermions that they don't move on that lattice, it, you can, one can solve it analytically uh, exactly in one dimension and at low feelings in higher dimensions. And one gets this very simple expression uh, with the pen on this NF, that's the occupation of the fermions. That could be between zero and one. Uh, this NB is the occupation of the side of the bosons that could be arbitrarily large and the interaction between bosons and fermions. So, so you see it's a very simple oscillatory behavior. So if you look at these are the, the one particle correlations in real space, the non-local ones. So if you look at this in a plot as a function of, of time, so initially you have these correlations that decay as, as one over the distance, and there are an oscillation because of the, the Fermi uh, uh, momentum. So, so that's the initial state. And as this goes, if the occupation of these bosons is sufficiently large, you can get into a situation is that at half the period, there are no correlations whatsoever uh, uh, for the Fermi. So essentially there is, uh, uh, the, the state is kind of uh, similar to a focus state, is uh, a purely localized state. So if you go now to momentum space, um, what you expect is to see that uh, initially you have a, a, a Fermi uh, distribution and after this half a period is gone. 
So they, they try to look into that, but uh, the experiments have to deal with uh, the fact that they have real systems. So and fermions have this uh, Fermi pressure. So they ended up having a system in which the fermions, which are these ones in here, are much larger than the bosons. And on top of that, since they are ha having different traps, they were displaced. So these that I described in here happen only in this part in which there was an overlap. So, so hence, one doesn't expect to see this complete collapse, but some oscillation. And in this, that's what they see. Okay, so they see this coherent oscillation with precisely uh, the period that that uh, one can advance analytically. And uh, uh, the other important thing they saw is that contrast in contrast to what you expect in the, the in the theory, which is just perfect collapse and and revival, these momentum distribution functions were evolving, and uh, eventually they will reach some equilibrium. And this talk is mostly about that. Okay, so they can see. The, the coherent part at very short time. And on top of that, they can see how it decays to uh, some, some equilibrium state that, that I was showing in the, in the numerical um, experiment. Okay, so and what we want to understand is what happens at, at those long times. What is that equilibrium state? So at this point, I can take, uh, I mean, if, if there is any, any question about those, uh, those experiments and kind of the motivation, I can take a question. Or, or just move on. Good. So, yeah, good. So, so then let me just make some connections, uh, and before before then I get to to discuss what happened in the system. So the first connection is uh, this this uh, beautiful dynamics that I could predict at short times, and the the thing that was happening in experiments at at long times. And in classical mechanics, we we know that there are two a kind of extreme uh, a different dynamics, and that are uh, represented here by these uh, particles in billiards. So we have this case, we have a circular billiard. We have uh, something that looks like kind of beautiful, regular. That's because that system is integrable. And then in, in classical mechanics, we can uh, uh, rigorously define integrability. So if we have n degrees of freedom and there are n functionally independent constant of emotion that are in involution, then there is this uh, uh, integrability, Liouville integrability theorem that tells us that there is a canonical transformation uh, into action angle variables and in action angle variables, the dynamics is, is triggered. Okay, so that's one limit. That if you want um, is what, uh, what was happening in my model of that experiment when I had uh, these bosons and fermions that they could not move around, but they interacted. So that was an integrable model and it had perfectly regular dynamics. Uh, the other limit is, uh, is the, the limit that is showing here and that we just uh, put it under the umbrella of chaos. And we said, uh, well, that's like exponential sensitivity of trajectories to perturbation. So essentially if we, we take uh, the particle and we put it uh, in some place of that billiard and slightly change the, the angle, what will happen is after a few collisions, you know, the, the positions are going to be completely uncorrelated and, and also the, the velocities of the particles. So in now when we go into quantum, uh, in the quantum world, this chaos, uh, we relate it to, to something else, uh, which is a uh, random matrix theory. And that's, uh, that's a big field that started in the, in the 50s when people were trying to understand what was happening with the spectra of, of uh, nuclei. And then uh, Wigner and Dyson came up with this idea of, look, let's, let's forget about the details. Let's try to, to describe the statistical properties. And then they just uh, did something kind of dramatic and amazing. It's like, well, let's just think of them as uh, potentially being described by, by random matrices with the appropriate, appropriate symmetries. And, and surely enough, when, when they uh, uh, look into the experimental uh, result for the spectra, they found that the statistic of this level spacing was described by, by random matrix theory. And uh, this is uh, this is experimental data in here, and the prediction of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and very different from Poisson. So it took quite a long time uh, before this was connected to, to what was happening uh, in quantum systems. So that could describe the dynamics. And so you see it in here. So you see this was in the 60s. And 
took to the late 70s, there were uh, two conjectures, one by Barry and Tabor and the other one even later by uh, Bohigas, Janoni, and Schmidt. So, and what these conjectures were telling was that, okay, so if we have uh, a quantum system whose uh, classical counterpart is integrable, uh, the statistic of the level space is going to be described by the Poisson distribution. And of course, uh, you can quickly uh, construct a counterexample to that to, to have a perfectly integrable system with a Wigner Dyson distribution. So, so this is something that uh, we have it as a conjecture, and this is what typically happens uh, for integrable systems. So the other conjecture is uh, for a quantum chaotic system, or is applied to quantum systems that have a classical counterpart. And uh, the statement is that in that case, uh, the statistic is described by the wigner dyson distribution. And uh, so these are, for example, two, two cases of um, uh, rectangular billiard that one can see that is perfectly described, is integrable, perfectly described by the uh, Poisson distribution. And this cavity in here, which is perfectly described by this uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble distribution. Now, these were uh, initially all these conjectures were for, uh, as you see, systems, classic uh, systems that quantum system that have a, a classically chaotic counterpart. But it turns out that this applies beyond that. So it applies to models that don't have a classical counterpart. And those are kind of the models I'm going to be discussing in this lecture. And they relate to those models that, that are created in the experiment. So this is an example of a model of fermions uh, in one dimension. And they can hop and have interactions. And these are hoping an interaction between nearest neighbor sites. So remember, now I'm putting in a lattice. So I have nearest neighbor sites hoping an interaction. Both of the fermions move around. And they can also hop and interact with next nearest neighbor sites. OK, and you can create, and I will show you the ver different versions of this model with hardcore bosons and a spin one half. So they, they are all mappable one into the other. Now, the reason I'm putting so many terms is because if you exclude these two terms in here, this model with hopping and interaction is known to be integrable and better answered solvable. So if you look at the level spacing distribution of this part of the model, so when V prime and J prime are zero, is perfectly described by the uh, Poisson distribution. And if you go away from that, uh, that regime, so you make this of the same order as, uh, as J and V, then you get that is described by the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Okay, so perfectly, uh, uh, nearly perfect agreement between the prediction of random matrix theory and what we see in these physical models. So this talk is going to be about this kind of models. Okay, so models whose, if we look at the uh, level spacing uh, distribution, they are going to be uh, described by, by random matrix theory. So, and this is, yes. B prime is, is just one number. We set it to this and it's not random. Okay, so that, that's an excellent question. So let me, let me, this is amazing, right? About, and that's why it is amazing uh, what Wigner and Dyson uh, did, right? So these models, okay? So if we think of this, we want to build the matrix for this model, okay? So this is a matrix that first is very sparse and there is there are no random numbers on that matrix okay so these all the numbers that you will the very few non zeros that you have are just these numbers 1 or j prime b prime which would be fixed okay no randomness whatsoever so yet uh um it it have exactly they have exactly the same distribution predicted by random matrix theory for a dense matrix in which everything inside it are random numbers. Okay. Okay. I can take other questions. So so really this is uh, sort of the picture and and we're still learning about it. Um, and uh, we still don't have uh, you know kind of the microscopic uh, understanding of how this. Uh, uh, this thing connect, right? How this random matrix theory uh, connect to these physical Hamiltonians, we just know that that is happening, okay? There are there are really no proofs. Uh, and you see what the difficulties are in here, right? So you have this matrix, right? In which you remove these terms and it's perfectly uh, Poisson. 
And then you add these terms, which are not random and so on. They will be still very sparse. And then you get this transition to, to a Wigner Dyson distribution. OK, I can take other questions. OK, good. Sounds good. So, so then let me move on uh, to, to what the problems that, that, uh, that, what are the problems that we face? Okay. So now we, we are talking about a quantum system, right? It has unitary dynamics. So let me, let me set up the, the problem here. So I'm going to be studying the unitary dynamics under some Hamiltonian age. Uh, and I'm going to start with an initial state that I'm going to assume is a pure, a pure state. And, uh, that is not an eigenstate of that Hamilton. Okay, so the expectation value of uh, of the energy in that uh, system is not going to change uh, during the the unitary evolution, and it's just it's just given by this. So, and then we have observables like the ones I show you in the numerical experiments and in the real experiments. So, density distribution, momentum distribution. Um, which are going to evolve in time. And I'm going to assume that they evolve unitarily, so that the wave function evolve unitarily. So when we talk about this question of thermalization, it's not, uh, what we are asking is not whether the state will become uh, mixed and described by density matrix. We know that that doesn't happen, okay? So so we, we are going to move that question not to what is happening to the state, but what is happening actually to the observable. Okay, because we saw that they evolve and they equilibrate. So what we want to understand is uh, why they are doing that and how we can describe them uh, after they equilibrate. So that's the setup of the problem. And what is it that then we could potentially call thermalization? Well, if, if as we saw in the numerical experiments and in the experiments, so at some time, after some T star that we don't know what it is, it's probably uh, determined by the initial state, the observables stop uh, evolving, so they just fluctuate. And if we can describe them by uh, some ensemble of statistical mechanics, say the microcanonical ensemble set by the energy, the canonical ensemble by the temperature, or the grand canonical by the temperature and the chemical potential. Okay, so. Now, and here the, it's important that, that we have two potential limits in, will, in which we, we need to think about this. Uh, the first limit is uh, this, uh, the limit in which we take a lattice to go to be infinity, and then we take uh, long times. Or the other thing that can happen, and actually the experiments are all finite, is uh, what happens in finite systems and how we can describe uh, the time average of observables. So, so let's, let's think about now uh, a finite system. And uh, we have the evolution of the, the time evolution of the observables. We can write it this way. So all I did in here is I wrote the initial state in, the, in a basis formed by the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which I call alpha here. So I plug this in here, OK? And then this, I plug it in here. And then you see uh, the time evolution is determined by, by the projections of the initial state into the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. The frequencies, the energy difference between those eigenstates and the matrix elements of the observable. Good. So now the next thing that I'm going to do is, uh, OK, I'm going to assume that I have this uh, finite uh, system as the one I show you in the numerical experiment. And uh, what we can say is like, okay, so if the system equilibrate, the observable equilibrate states uh, most of the time at some value, that value should be the one that one predicts taking the infinite time average of the, ti of the time evolution of the observable. So and then if one takes this infinite time average in here, and we assume that the, there are no uh, you know, significant degeneracies, so what will happen is that whenever there are energy difference, they will fluctuate at infinite time. So those terms like are going to cancel. And this infinite time average is just determined by the diagonal, uh, the diagonal matrix element of the observable. Okay. And this is what we call the prediction of the diagonal ensemble, which is this ensemble here, determined by this uh, projection of the initial state into the eigenstate of Hamilton. Right. And now the question that we are trying to understand in here is this in quantum mechanics, you see, depends on exponentially many numbers. And when we try to do a statistical mechanics, we just have ordered one numbers. And 
it is a question, then will this uh, result be ever predicted by really statistical mechanics? Okay, and here again, we have to, to be aware that there are these two limits that you can take the finite system and do the infinite time average. And the other thing that you can do is take the infinite system and take the long times. And um, this in principle need not commute, but, but for all these problems, we find that they do. Okay, so if we take finite system, take infinite time average and, and then take the thermodynamic limit, that we get the same result that if we take the infinite system and take the, the long time limit of that, okay? Because you see it in here, right? So if we have a, a finite system, right? Even if after T star for most of the time, uh, the observable doesn't change, they will be revivals. So this cannot be true at all times, okay? So it's gonna be true for finite systems at most time. For infinite systems, then it will be true at, at long times. Okay. Any question about this? Good. So so then uh you know here you can even start asking yourself, is this uh even a meaningful question? I mean, can these two things ever be the same? Uh I'm going to be interested in both of them. So I'm going to be interested in O of T, whether it, it approaches the this, this prediction, this infinite time average, and whether it is equal to this in here. I'm going to be addressing those three questions. OK. And, uh, and then, uh, then there is this other thing that, that I, was, uh, I was mentioning is like, do they, I mean, does it even make sense to ask the question? Because you can immediately see, right? So let, let's think about the statistical mechanics. What it does is like, let's say micro canonical ensemble, it goes to a place in the spectrum of, of that Hamiltonian, and then it carries out an average over a small window there, right? So if my initial state is actually composed of states that are away from that, even, even if the mean uh, value of the energy is the same, but it's sampling states that are away from that point, then these two will not be equal, okay? So we need to put some constraints in there. So when, when in, in the context of typicality, uh, the way that that's dealt with is all DC alphas are chosen to be in the micro canonical way, okay? That's just postulated there. So we take them, I mean, or they take them from the micro canonical window. So we can be a bit more general than that and argue how is it that they can actually fall in that window? Uh, but that requires putting some uh, physical context, okay? And the physical context is, is locality. So let me, let me try to go through this argument here. So let's assume that we have an initial state that is an eigenstate of some initial Hamiltonian that is local, okay? And then uh, what we are gonna do is study the dynamics under a new Hamiltonian, which is local, and it's going to be that Hamiltonian, we can write it as a sum of the initial Hamiltonian plus some other uh, set of terms, which are, uh, which are local. Okay, so and by local here, I mean this WI, right? This is this some operator that lives in that lattice and that can have, uh, you know, support in order one, right? Something that doesn't change with the system size of order one uh, lattice size around it. So, so say, for example, for this model I show you with nearest and next nearest neighbor uh, hoping in an interaction, this operator has support in sites that are one side and two sides away from, from that J. Okay, that's what I mean by, by local. So these Ws have support on, on order one side around, around J. Good, so, so once you've set it up that way, so uh, H is local because H initially is local and this one is local. Uh, one can ask this question, what are the energy fluctuations after the quenching? right? So, well, by definition that, that's gonna be the expectation value of the H square minus expectation value of H uh, and then the square outside. And because of how we set up the initial stage, one can show that, that we can rewrite it at, as the square root of this difference in here. 
Then next, what we can do is just go and use the local structure of our operator W. So, so we can rewrite this in here as a double sum over the J's, okay? And then we, you see we have these W's in here in the initial state, and then uh, the subtracted expectation value of each of the W's. So this are, is a connected correlation. And the important thing now is that if this initial state Okay, doesn't have long range connected correlations. Okay, and uh, for those W operators, you see that uh, this sum, right, will be truncated after a given number of terms for J2, let's say, for every J1 after some on order one number of J2 around that J1 is going to be truncated. So the only sum that, ex that, uh, that scale with the system size is the sum over J1. And we get that then these fluctuations of the energy are going to be uh, proportional to the square root of the volume of the number of particles and so on. And this is exactly what the statistical mechanics does. So, so all this uh, ensemble of statistical mechanics, uh, they consider uh, uh, energy windows, which like fluctuations of the, of the energy are, are polynomial. So this is sub-extensive, right? So if we take delta E divided by E, it's going to be one over square root of, in, of N. So and what this tells us is for this kind of quenches, uh, ultimately the, the states that matter are, are the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian that are around the mean energy of the system. And they are essentially sampling the same set of states that that one samples uh, in with a statistical mechanics ensembles, except uh, for the fact that we don't know in which way they are sampled. Okay, that's fully determined by the initial state. Okay, so this kind of saying that for this kind of problems, this this kind of quenches, it makes sense to ask the question of whether uh, statistical mechanics uh, describe the system or not. Okay, because at this level we say we know that uh, the states that are sampled by, sampled by that diagonal ensemble, uh, they have support in a sub-extensive uh, region of the spectrum as a statistical mechanics ensembles. Good. So, so then that's just to, to say, well, this is, this is a meaningful question without having to postulate that the, the initial state uh, is supported in the, in the microcanonical way. So now let's go to the dynamics. And I'm going to show you now dynamics for that model that I introduced before, except that I'm going to write it in terms of bosons because uh, they are somehow more experimentally relevant. So these are bosons that hop nearest neighbor and have nearest neighbor interactions. And then they hop next nearest neighbor and have next nearest neighbor interaction. And here comes the, the, the first problem that, uh, that we face when we think about this. So I told you that we can write the time evolution like this, and the initial state we expanded in the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, and then we take this infinite time average and we get the diagonal sample. But then of course, uh, you can ask, but wait a second, what is the time you need to see this diagonal ensemble? Because this energy difference, they, they are uh, in general exponentially small in the, in the system size. So that will tell you, you need ridiculously large systems to see it. Okay, so now, now going to Nalini's question. So the first thing I want to address is uh, just show you a numerical experiment in which I want to study the evolution of some uh, observable and I want to compare it with the prediction of this infinite time average. Okay, and the question is, does it get there in some order one, like a uh, reasonable physical time? Good. So, so this is this, uh, this setup in here. This is an obse observable that is of interest uh, is this uh, density density structure factor is a Fourier transform of density density correlations. And I'm going to show you the dynamics for eight bosons in a lattice with 24 sides. And it's going to be this quench in which we fix this J prime and B prime, and then take an eigenstate of the model with these parameters of J and V, and we evolve it under uh, new uh, Hamiltonian parameters one and one. Okay, so, this is, for example, the initial uh, structure factor, and this is the prediction of that infinite time average. And this uh, I can I can do because what we can fully diagonalize this uh, this Hamiltonian. There are uh, it's, a, it's a matrix that is tens of thousands of of uh, 
of uh, element squares, so so we can diagonalize. So now let me show you the actual dynamics, and the time is going to be given in in units of the Hamiltonian time. And order one means physically meaningful, and if it, if it's something that is a billion, then it's not physically meaningful. So this is the the dynamics, and uh, what you see is that very quickly the uh, the structure factor like equilibrates or goes into this infinite time range and then stays fluctuating about it. So that's to say that what I show you in that other, uh, in the starting numerical experiment, that equilibrated result is the prediction of that infinite time average. Okay, and it stays around it. Okay, so now at least we have a theoretical way uh, to predict what, what, what it's doing, very costly because uh, I need uh, these exponentially many parameters to set that diagonal ensemble, but, but we know where the system is going. Good. So, so that's the first question, right? And, uh, and this, I have to admit, that is uh, probably the part of all these dynamics that is less understood analytically. Uh, why is it that this, happen, this happens in order one time and you don't need exponentially long time? Okay. So I am, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, this is because there is a conservation, this conserved particle number and, and this point is, is removed, is related to, to the number of particles. So, so it's fixed. So it, it could be either something large or zero, it doesn't move. Okay, so yeah, there is nothing in, in, uh, special about it beyond the fact that it's, it's fixed by by the conservation of uh, the particle number in, in this model. So the only thing that is evolving really is, is everything else. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, that question. Good. So this question of why it equilibrates to that infinite time average in order one time, I'm not going to address it. I'm just going to take it for granted and uh, and move on from there. Okay, so this depends on the initial state, uh, probably depends on the on the models and so on, and, and we don't have a good understanding of uh, what determines that, that time scale in general. Good, so, but it, it, it decays to that. So now I can address the second question that I was telling Nalini that, that I will address, which is how do the this infinite time average and the prediction of statistical mechanics compare, okay? And, so I can do now a microcanonical calculation. You see, yeah, I just take the observable, I average over states in some uh, microcanonical window, and I can obtain this microcanonical prediction and compare it to this diagonal ensemble that, that comes from statistical mechanics. And if I do that, this is the result. At this scale, you cannot see the difference between the microcanonical ensemble and the diagonal ensemble. Okay, so very clearly different from the initial state. I can also do a canonical calculation, and it is is going to produce very similar results. Okay, so then the next question one could ask is how does the difference, right? I mean, something that you don't see in here between the diagonal and the microcanonical ensemble depend on the parameters of the Hamiltonian, which in here I just took to be very far from the integrable point. And this is the kind of, of, uh, of result you get. So these are the difference, just quantifying uh, how, how much the, the microcanonical ensemble deviates for the diagonal. And what you see is that at the integrable point, which is this zero, when t, this j prime and b prime are zero, they are different. But as you move away from that point, uh, that difference decay, and as you increase the system size, they become even smaller. And if you increase the energy of the state, it also smaller. So, so from this, uh, really, what we uh, conclude as physicists is that uh, you know, if you have a sufficiently large system, um, the difference between this microcanonical ensemble and the diagonal ensemble are going to vanish. So, essentially, that uh, statistical mechanics describes what happens at. Uh, for those time averages, okay? Even though it has only one parameter or two parameters. That brings us to, to the first part of eigenstate thermalization, which explains why, why 
why this this is so. So you see what I what I was showing you is that on the one side, which is this diagonal ensemble, I have this sum depends on exponentially many parameters in here, uh, the projection of the initial state into the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And on the other side, I did a statistical mechanics. So there is only one parameter in here, which is this E. And well, this delta E, the width, which you have to be careful, but it, the results are robust against changing this. So how can these two terms be equal, considering the fact that the, there are exponentially many numbers in here that you have to fix, and in here there's only one? And one potential uh, answer to that goes as follows. So suppose that all these O alphas were very similar. So you remember, I told you that the energy fluctuations are uh, um, sub-extensive in the system side. So it means that this is sampling states that have the same energy. So if all of them would have the same expectation value of the observable, you could take this out and you have the normalization. And here you could take it out and you have N. And the two are equal. And that's precisely what the diagonal part of eigenstate thermalization tells us, which is that the expectation values of few body observables in an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian are smooth functions of the energy, and they are essentially uh, the microcanonical uh, ensemble uh, uh, prediction. So another way to, to say this is that whenever we were doing microcanonical ensemble or canonical ensemble, we were averaging over things that were the same. And uh, and then we could just take in one state, and that would have been enough. Okay, so so then what that tells us in here, if we go back to this expression, is that within that, that small window, sub-extensive, it doesn't matter what these C's are, right? So it doesn't matter how they sample uh, the eigenstate because all the eigenstates have the same expectation value. So so that's that's how eigenstate thermalization allow us to understand why this is equal for uh, for a widely uh, differing initial states. And let me just show you that this is true. Now we can go back and do the numerical calculations and look at the expectation values like at this operator in different eigenstates with energies close to the energy of the uh, initial state. And you see they are on top of the of the prediction of the diagonal ensemble. And you can take one point here and plot it for the entire spectrum. And you see this kind of behavior. So this is the prediction of, let's say, the canonical ensemble. And you see there are fluctuations, but as you increase the system size, they become narrower and narrower. And in the thermodynamic limit, what we expect to see is just all the state falling on this line. OK, and this, yeah. Right. Yeah, right, good, good. So the observable is this structure factor, but in fact, uh, let me just show you, uh, this is not, not true in the integrability, but in fact, this is being studied for different models and different observables, okay? Like for example, this transfer field is in model in two dimension, and this is the anti-ferromagnetic structure factor. These observables, uh, what they have in common is that they are few body, but they can be non-local in this case. You see, you sum over the entire lattice, or they could be local, like in this case, you you sum uh, uh, over like nearest neighbor outside. So, so the the there is no essential assumption of the observable. It's a few body observable for those Hamiltonians. Okay, and they could be uh, either uh, local or not local. That that really doesn't matter. And and we always see. That uh, that if you look at, uh, at those observable in the entire spectrum, they become a smooth function of the energy. That's true whenever you are away from the integrable point, and not true when you are at the integrable point. So, for example, this would be the classical easy model in two dimension. It doesn't satisfy eigenstate thermalization. You have to uh, you have to uh, introduce this uh, quantum part, and 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 then you get this uh, smooth behavior. And this is the model I showed you before for one dimension, uh, in which if you're in the integrable regime, you see no eigenstate thermalization, large fluctuations, and non-integrable. Uh, you can see that, that there's a smooth function. And the other thing we can quantify is what happens with the support as you increase system size, and we find that it decreases exponentially fast with increasing system size. So this is an exponential. That's correct, but remember, these are all 
few body. Okay, okay. So that's that's what is common to these operators, and the reason we are interested in few body because those are the ones that are measured in experiments. Okay, in, in experiment, one can look at one particle, two particle correlation, local and non-local, right? They can look at density and momentum. So momentum distributions is non-local, uh, one body, and density is local, one body. They can look at both of them. And we see this eigenstate thermalization working equally well for both. Okay, of course, we know that this cannot be true for all operators, right? For example, if I take uh, an operator that is the projection into one eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, right? We know that if I look at the entire spectrum, the, this operator, the expectation value is going to be zero in all eigenstates, but one, the one to which you are projecting. And then for that one, it's going to be one, right? So this eigenstate thermalization clearly cannot be true for all possible operators that you can construct. Okay, good. So, so now there is a second question that is important for thermalization, uh, which is that, well, good. we want to describe the, the average, right? The average is the, the thermal prediction, but we also need the fluctuation about the average to be small, right? Because if the fluctuations are large, uh, at any time that you measure, you will see something different from your thermal prediction, right? I mean, this is like telling, uh, like, like, uh, uh, why it is important to know what are the daytime and nighttime temperatures in the desert as opposed to the average, right? So the average would not tell you that you are going to die there. So, so this is essentially the second question that we need to, uh, to address, which is how are the fluctuations? And then if we look at numerically what is happening, and this is, for example, what is the difference between this operator, right? This structure factor at each given time, and the diagonal ensemble prediction integrated over k, just to make one take one number out of it. And I'm plotting here what happens as a function of time for different parameters of the Hamiltonian. This is even the integrable regime, the integral limit, and this is away from the integral. And this is what happens. Now you see in times order one, the difference decreased uh, substantially, right? And then they fluctuate. And as you increase the system size, you see that the fluctuations decrease. As a matter of fact, they decrease exponentially uh, rapidly with, uh, uh, with increasing system size. So this part we, we understand uh, uh, theoretically. This fast decay here is the one I was telling you. This is something we don't understand well. So let's take a look at this fluctuation. So how can we characterize them? So, well, you can ask, are they always small because there is defacing? So let, let's compute what the variance is, okay, and you see it again, I'm taking an infinite time average, I'm taking the observable square, and I'm subtracting the average square. And you can go through the calculation, and it uh, is something that depends only on the off-diagonal matrix elements, and the projection. Here again, we can do that, that uh, uh, kind of uh, very... Uh, AC, one, Yori, uh, okay, let's assume that all these are very similar. You take it out, then you see the sums are normalization. So you see that the fluctuations are of the order of the typical of diagonal matrix cell, the magnitude of the typical of diagonal matrix cell. So going back to the average, I, I was telling you that is of the order of the typical diagonal. So for this to be much smaller than this, we need the typical of diagonal to be much smaller than the typical diagonal, okay? And if we go numerically, that's exactly what happens. Now, these are the matrix elements of this operator, okay? This uh, structure factor at pi, and you see some matrix in here. Uh, the matrix elements uh, here, I changed the beta parameter here, the alpha around some energy. And you see the diagonal elements, they go out of the scale. And the off diagonals are this, uh, this background that is very small, close to zero. OK, so, so for those fluctuations to be small, we need these off diagonal matrix elements to be uh, very small. And, and one could ask, I mean, can we do without them? And of course, we cannot do without them, because everything that happens as a function of time happens because they are non-zero. So really, all the dynamics. Uh, in these quantum systems comes from this off-diagonal. And, and, you know, we put 
quite some time in the last 10 years to understand, understand what their structure is. And these are, for example, uh, results obtaining one dimensional systems for different operators. And this is uh, in log scale because I told you they are very small. The absolute value of this of diagonal square as a function of the energy difference. And you see, and this is, a, this is the log of the average. So you see there is some structure. So they decay fast at uh, high frequency and, and there is a lot of interesting information at low frequencies. And you know they are uh, qualitatively similar for different observables, but they 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 have uh, features that are different, and that's why dynamics in general is going to be different. As a matter of fact, we uh, we look carefully into how they scale, and 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 we can we can show that they scale uh, exponentially with the system size. So, for example, what I'm showing here is we take this average multiplied by the Hilbert space dimension. We even can uh, take into account logarithmic corrections which come from the system size. So we, what I'm plotting here is for different system size, this, this quantity, and you can see that they collapse. Okay, this, uh, this smooth function collapse. So we have a good handle on it. And for these two operators and at high frequency is exponentially small as far as, as we can see. So this brings about the second part of eigenstate thermalization, which uh, deals uh, or describes what happens with this off-diagonal matrix elements. Okay, so this is the full answer for eigenstate thermalization. Uh, the first term is the diagonal part, which I told you uh, earlier, and the second term is about the off-diagonals, and the statement is that they are exponentially small. Actually, in the uh, thermodynamic entropy, they have a smooth function, which is precisely this function I show you here. And there is some random number that uh, that one one needs to be careful about. Okay, but uh, but this is the full statement uh, for eigenstate thermalization, and you see that that it comes out uh, from what we uh, we see in, in in real systems, which uh, local interactions. Good. So, so now you can ask, okay, do we have an understanding of this, right? And there were some, uh, Mark Shaniki had told me that there are some works uh, for single particle that they have some structure like this. Uh, we can actually understand this coming back to random matrix theory if we ask what are, uh, uh, what is the structure of uh, operators, uh, uh, Hermitian operator in random matrices, okay? So let's take some operator with some spectrum. And let's look at the matrix elements in uh, the eigenstate of some random matrix that uh, we can think of them as random orthogonal uh, uh, unit vectors. So we are interested in what are the properties of the average. And you immediately see that to leading order, we can say that the average is just this average uh, of, the, uh, of the spectrum of, of that operator. And the off diagonals are zero. So, so this is the, the leading part. So you can also look into the fluctuations and what you find is that the fluctuations of the diagonals are related to the off diagonals. And actually there is an integer here that depends on the symmetry of the, of the random matrix. But uh, what you see is that they are exponentially small. So from random matrix theory, this would be kind of the equivalent of the eigenstate thermalization ansatz. So there is no structure in energy or frequency but there are the diagonal part and exponentially small uh, of diagonal part, okay? With this relation of the factor of two, which uh, remarkably, if one looks into physical models like this 2D IC model and look at the variance of the diagonals and the off diagonal, so again, nothing random in this Hamiltonian, uh, you get exactly the factor of two that is uh, uh, predicted by random matrix here. Okay, so so that's that's it. That's all I wanted to tell you. So now I'm like I'm looking forward to to answering more questions. So what is it that we've learned? I mean, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, is that if we take uh, isolated quantum systems, no randomness, local Hamiltonians, very sparse matrices, they exhibit both equilibration and thermalization in general. Okay, so. Of course, there are finite size effects. There are these limits of infinite time uh, and uh, an infinite system that one needs to be careful, but, but it happens. And it happens also in the experiments. 
And the way we understand that thermalization occurs is through this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that, uh, that tell us that the expectation value of the uh, observables in the eigenstates are a smooth function of the energy, which is nothing but the microcanonical uh, predictions. Um, uh, we also know that this is not to be taken for granted that this happens because both thermalization and eigenstate thermalization break down as one approaches an integrable point. And actually, the integrable system are not, are not they don't thermalize. So, so which uh, opens this question of what, what is the quantum equivalent of the KM theorem, which we have actually looked into uh, also recently. And uh, the other thing we learned is that the time fluctuations are small. So we don't know why operators get very quickly to the diagonal ensemble, but we do. what we do know is uh, why uh, the fluctuations about the diagonal ensemble are small. And this is because the off-diagonal matrix elements are small. And um, the picture, uh, so that uh, that emerged from this is that you prepare an initial state, which is a coherent superposition of uh, essentially thermal eigenstates, and that's why it doesn't look thermal. And as time goes, there is defacing, and and then you look uh, essentially at the properties of the of of all of these states, which are the same. And finally, integrable systems are different, and uh, they are described by a different uh, kind of statistical mechanics ensemble, and there are a set of rules that are slightly different. So with that, I want to thank you. I'm going to thank my collaborators and the support from this agency, and um, thank you very much for your attention.